Okay, so this is, um, sorry about the title, it's, it's very long. So, um, it, anyway, so this is uh, an extension of some work that I did with um, my colleague who, who was my PhD supervisor, Jorgen Fredriksen. And so, um, a few years ago, we, we developed an extension of the direct interaction approximation to inhomogeneous flows that have some application for problems in the atmosphere. And so just recently, we did some work Markovianizing that, that approach. Uh, and so that's really what I'm going to talk about. OK, so um, Creighton's DIA has uh, largely been abandoned uh, in, over recent years due to the, you know, the problem of incorrectly predicting the inertial range exponent of the power law decay. And that's for both two- and three-dimensional turbulence. Um, so these lower order statistical closures that don't accurately describe the higher order correlations associated with the formation of coherent structures in 2D turbulence. Um, but for turbulent geophysical flows where Rossby waves are present, uh, these linear wave effects can tend to in inhibit the formation of those coherent structures. And so we think there's some utility to applying 2.2 time closures such as the DIA um, for geophysical transport calculations application of the DIA to inhomogeneous turbulence, it's a difficult problem, um, part due to memory requirements. If we're looking at synoptic uh, formation of, say, blocks and other large-scale features in, in, the, in the synoptic atmosphere, it requires about five days of memory to, to capture the growth of those instabilities. So any 2.2 uh, time closure, uh, inhomogeneous closure, you have to carry around that kind of memory. Um, so Markovian closures where only equal time correlations are predict uh, correlation data is predicted and time history effects are approximated by a triad interaction times um, and knowing only the current value of the triad relaxation time and the other state variables, these have proved very popular and of great utility and, and so we're motivated to try and extend this approach to those problems. So just to sort of put a bit of background, so, as I said, the non-Markovian closures, and, and there's the, the three more general um, two-time uh, isotropic uh, approaches, which is the Creighton's direct interaction approximation, Jack Herring's self-consistent field theory, and David McCone's local energy transfer theory, and, and I've included our inhomogeneous form there. They're computationally costly. So, um, where, so they go like order of n cubed, where n is the number of time steps. Um, they're Galilean invariant in that they're invariant to translation, rotation, and uniform motion, but they tend to violate Galilean invariance, so they're realization dependent. And that's this idea that there's spurious convection effects on the small scale eddies by the large scale eddies lead to the incorrect modeling of the inertial range kinetic energy spectra. Um, so Another way to think of it is that these two-time correlation functions spuriously carry the interactions between the large and small scales into the equal time correlation functions. So the Markovian closures assume that the rate at which the memory integral decays is much faster than the time scale in which the covariance has evolved. So they're only equal time correlation functions. They satisfy random Galilean invariance. So some work in in 1993 by um, John Bowman, John Cromies and, and Otto Viani, uh, they postulated that the EDQNM um, is not, which is one of these uh, Markovian closures, is not realizable in the presence of waves. Uh, and so they were looking at the drift wave problem, hasagawa mima equation. Um, so uh, we haven't actually tested that, whether it's true or not. Uh, I think that they probably are realisable if you include the empirical tuning parameter. So Bowman postulated that um, a, re a realisable Markovian closure uh, that's realisable in the presence of waves. Um, but in general, the, the problem is one of finding a principle to t determine the decay rate of these response functions. So we're going to apply the fluctuation dissipation ansatz of Bowman to our um, inhomogeneous uh, closure and, and derive a Markovianized variant. Okay, so, so um, just to set more of the background, I'm going to spend a bit of time describing what this um, quasi-diagonal direct interaction approximation is that, 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 we, that forms our inhomogeneous uh, version of the DIA. 
So it's an, it work, it's an outstanding problem of how to generalise isotropic self-consistent field theories of Creighton and others to these general inhomogeneous flows, including realistic topography. The other thing is how, how to incorporate large-scale Rossby waves, say on a beta plane, and how to deal with long integrations of time history integrals. So as I've indicated, atmospheric regime transitions typically require time history information over many days. So formally, it, we, we also have to deal with this problem of vertex renormalisation. So it's a second order uh, propagator renormalised closure. You've, approx you've approximated some of the higher order moments to some approximation, but formally the, the, the vertex terms, are, a, a lack of vertex renormalisation leads to this underrepresentation of the small scale um, kinetic energy. So this is a general problem of quadratic nonlinearity and strong coupling. So uh, for, fin infin for infinite resolution and moderate Reynolds numbers, the, the DIA underpredicts the inertial range kinetic energy, as do the other, other variants, such as the LET theory and self-consistent field theory. So I show that these, these three closures are actually based on differing interpretations or applications of the fluctuation dissipation theorem. For finite resolution and moderate Reynolds number, all of these in homogeneous two-point Markovian, non-Markovian closures underestimate the small-scale kinetic energy uh, and dramatically underestimate the skewness. So this is due to the fact that, as, as I said, we've renormalised the propagators, the vertices are bare, and the decay times of the two-time cumulant response functions are determined incorrectly by the energy-containing range rather than by the local <coughs> excitation levels. So a vertex renormalisation would include the damping effect or include these indirect interactions uh, thereby imposing interaction of eddies with those in a nearby local wave number space and while at the same time restricting any spurious non-local interactions. So just to begin with, so I'm going to start with the barotropic vorticity equation. So all the results I'll present will be uh, two-dimensional turbulence uh, in spectral space with circular truncation. Okay? So we start with the barotropic vorticity equation. I think this is the Jacobian. So the vorticity is related to the, the stream function by the Laplacian. Um, in the absence of forcing and dissipation, the two quadratic invariants, once we discretize, would be um, energy and entropy. Um, so just to emphasise that, that this is uh, a, an equation without a mean field, so that these are all, all transients. I'm going to use the notation where the diagonal uh, cumulant uh, or covariance, if you like, but here the cumulant is, is, is in this form and the off-diagonal terms are related by these wave numbers, P and Q. So I'm also going to use a notation where I'll, I'll refer to the, to the right-hand side of this tendency equation where it's homogeneous by this H term. And so you can see straight away that, that we have this problem of, of dealing with this three-point uh, two-time cumulant. So this is just the, you know, the mapping to spectral space. And as I said, we're going to consider KX, KY space. Uh, Z is the spectral component of the vorticity. Uh, and then we have this um, uh, dissipation operator. And here, so we're, on the, we're going to be on the doubly periodic plane. And so it, it's K squared. Um, so the other thing is we have these interaction coefficients uh, that couple the or triad interaction coefficients, uh, which have this form. And I'm going to use this notation for, for the, the conjugate. OK, so I'm going to use the, the direct interaction approximation um, from Creighton. And so here, I'm not going to go through it, but I'm just going to describe it. So we replace the, the three-point uh, two-time cumulant um, by, the, by the DIA, which has a, a nonlinear noise term and a nonlinear damping term. Okay. We also have an equation for the response function. So the response function describes the, uh, the effect of a, a small, of an infinitesimal perturbation at wave number L and at some time T prime um, on, on the field at K and time T. So in the DIA, it takes this following form. 
Here we again have this nonlinear damping term, uh, and the response function satisfies certain properties. Um, the identity, uh, it's causal, it's transitive, and, and it's statistically independent. And so, in, in, the, f in the notation that we're using here, the nonlinear noise and uh, the nonlinear damping and the nonlinear noise uh, take the following forms um, acting on the, these, these diagonal terms. We also have a, a, a single time cumulant equation. Here, uh, the, the right hand side turns out to be real, and, and similarly, there's a sim single time uh, equation for the response function. So, as I said, the, the, the main uh, homogeneous uh, closures, or isotropic closures, are related by application or, or choice of, of the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So, the FDT connects a linear response. Uh, relaxation from a non-equilibrium state um, to its classical fluctuation properties in equilibrium. So, you know, really there's, a, there's an infinity here, but we choose to apply this at, at some finite time, at some distance away from, from equilibrium. So the principle here is, that, is, to, is to, the idea is to find a principle to determine the decay rates. So the self-consistent field theory um, relates to the DIA simply by replacing the two-time cumulant equation with this fluctuation dissipation ansatz. And the local energy transfer theory of McComb, it replaces the two-time response function of the DIA with, with this choice of the FDT. So for the EDQNM, so in the absence of, of fourth-order uh, cumulant, so the EDQNM says that the DDT of the third moment is, is, is zero. And so we replace the fourth order cumulant and it removes the damping mechanism necessarily, necessary to bound the third order cumulant. So this replaces linear viscosity with an eddy viscosity, so linear plus turbulent viscosity. So according to Leith, um, the EDQNM is obtained by making the best Markovian fit to the DIA consistent with the underlying Langevin representation. Okay, so in the absence of, of waves, you know, ED, EDQM has a has a uh, an exact stochastic model, uh, so it's realizable. Um, the term EDQ and M refers to an entire family of closures that depend on the choice of an eddy damping parameter, and it can be freely adjusted to match the phenomenolo phenomenology of the inertial range. And and you know, these this is proved to be a powerful tool. So the FDT ansatz for the EDQ and M. Uh, is, is in this following form. So for the two-time cumulant equation, um, the, the EDQNM is we have a modified form of the FDT and assuming that the de exponential decay rate for the response function takes the following form uh, here. So this, is, this would be on the sphere. That's why we've got k, k plus 1 rather than k squared. Um, so here the, the, the dis dissipation operator and the eddy damping is given by this empirical form here, which has uh, an, a tuning parameter at the front. And so, you know, it's been found that for two-dimensional turbulence, a choice of 0 0.6 gives some pretty good comparison with direct numerical simulation. So, so Bowman or showed or, or, or proposed that in the presence of waves or complex mode coupling phenomena, this above FDT ansatz can lead or has the possibility of leading um, to the EDQ and M being non-realizable. So instead, that, that they propose a modified FTT, uh, which takes, takes the following form here. And here, CK to the half is the principal square root of the real part of the diagonal cumulant. And so we're going to apply um, this ansatz to derive a realizable Markovian two-point closure for two-dimensional turbulence in the presence of topography and Rosby waves. So the equation that we're going to use is an extension of the barotropic vorticity equation. So here we've included a large-scale east-west flow. We have some scale topography. We have the beta effect, so we have differential rotation. And we include an extra term which corresponds to the solid body zonal rotation vorticity. So it's a small term, but it allows us to have certain symmetry properties with the interaction coefficients. And, and I'll show, show you the result of that. We also have a form drag equation for the large scales. And so here S is the doubly periodic domain. We have a momentum flux, and we can also include some relaxation towards some observed flow. So again, the, the, the invariance in, in the absence of forcing a dissipation now take the, the following form for the, 
for the large and small scale kinetic energy and now in terms of the potential entropy. And, and there's actually a, a direct one-to-one -one mapping from this to the sphere. Okay, so if we write the, this equation in Fourier space, so we have the equation for the small scales, we have the interaction coefficients, um, a, a self-interaction term, a term that couples to the topography, and then we have, you know, uh, this, this extension to allow for the inclusion of, of, of um, large-scale Rossby waves and an east-west flow. And so I won't go through this, but, but, but this is the form that it takes. And here, F0 is the bare forcing, and we have a, a complex uh, dissipation which is related to the bare viscosity uh, and an intrinsic Rossby wave frequency by that expression. So, so just a, a couple of points on the dispersion relation. So as I said, here this is the bare forcing. Uh, we have a, a complex uh, viscosity. Um, we've also defined a, a zeta zero mode, okay? So uh, in here, as you saw earlier, there was a H0 term, um, which is taken to be zero, but could more generally be related to a large-scale topography. So we note that the, that the east-west flow is real, and we've defined uh, this term here to be um, imaginary. So this ensures that all the interaction coefficients are real, uh, and then it's, it's possible to, to extend the range of the interaction coefficients over P and Q to, to include uh, this new vector zero. And so the point of that is that um, we can now write uh, interaction coefficients uh, for, that involve uh, the mean field and the topography uh, in this form, and then with this extension to, to include this you know, large-scale east-west flow in the beta effect, uh, we still satisfy all the properties of, of, the, of the, the, you know, the cyclic properties of the of the interaction coefficients, but we can collapse all of this back into the same form that we had for the, for the F-plane, right? So we have to do the same thing for the large-scale flow, and you can take the form drag, large-scale form drag equation and, and pretty much do the same thing, collapse it into this, this uh, standard form where all of the complexity is moved to the choice of the interaction coefficients or, or definition of the interaction coefficients. So, so how do we get to the, uh, the closure? Okay, so, so we, we write an equation for the mean field uh, and the transients, uh, again in this following form, and you, you hit, immediately see that we have a, a covariance matrix or a two-point cumulant. Um, and so the, and here we make the assumption that the variation in the topography is small, so we define H to be the scaled spatial variation of the height of the topography relative to the total depth. So the equation for the, the diagonal uh, cumulant now has a, an inhomogeneous uh, component that's, that's added to the ho homogeneous term, and this involves um, the covariances or 2.2 time cumulants interacting with the topography and interacting with the mean field. So the problem is how, how to get a, a closure for those terms. So, so we do take the standard approach. Um, we do a, a perturbation expansion. Uh, here we, we go to second order, um, then we truncate and we renormalize. Okay. So, in keeping with the spirit of the DIA, but we, we make a couple of assumptions. So we assume that the perturbations are initially multivariate Gaussian, and that to the zeroth order they're diagonally dominant. Right. So that allows us to write to first order uh, the 2.2 time cumulant in the following form. Uh, and then we renormalize. And so, as I said, sufficient conditions for diagonal dominance are that the topography in the mean field is sufficiently small. However, at canonical equilibrium, the off-diagonal -diag elements of the equal time covariance vanish, and that's regardless of the size of the mean field and the topography. Okay. So the expression that we get for the two time two-point cumulant equations uh, is, is, is in the following form, and, and here I've, I've included uh, a cumulant update. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's a, a generalisation of the approach of Harvey Rose to, to truncating these long time history integrals and approximating uh, the off diagonal, diagonal uh, information in terms of diagonal elements. And similarly, the response function now includes the, this, this, this additional term that's, that's now coupling to the, to the mean field. 
as I said, we're, we're using the DIA for the three-point term and we're using this, this cumulant update in the form that, that Harvey Rose proposed. And so what we have here is that the QDIA equations include off-diagonal and non-Gaussian initial conditions through these, through these initial terms here and through the, the, ter init the cumulant update terms for the, for the two-point cumulant. Uh, we allow uh, initial con uh, information about uh, off-diagonal uh, elements in the two-point cumulant. Right, so this would be, in a more formal setting, a generalisation of the operator formalism of, of Decker and Harker and, and Rose. So the equation for the mean field now takes the following form. Um, we, we, we have a, you know, a, a, a minus p minus q term, uh, a term coupling to the topography, and now we have a term for the, for the um, effect of the, the, the nonlinear damping on the mean field and essentially a, a mean field topographic interaction term. And, and a mean forcing. So the tendency equation for the, for the uh, two, two time cumulant now takes the following form. So we, we have this nonlinear noise term and an inhomogeneous analog. We have a nonlinear damping term and an inhomogeneous analog. And then we, we have this, this update uh, setting which, which allows us to periodically co collapse the these long time history integrals. So this is just the, the form of the, the p's and the pi's, the, the, the inhomogeneous contributions now to the, to the tendency. So the response function also ha has a contribution from, from the interactions between the, the, the eddies in the mean field and topography. Um, and, you know, again, as I said, the, the, the right-hand side of the, the diagonal uh, single-time cumulant is, is, is again real. So I'm just going to show a few results of, of what, what this turns out to do. And so the, the diagnostics I'm going to use are essentially the, the transient energy entropy, um, the dissipation, uh, a large-scale Reynolds number, and we're also going to look at, look at skewness. OK, so um, okay, before I get to that, so if we just look at the, the, the homogeneous uh, form of the going back to the DIA, if we look at decaying isotropic turbulence, so what you find is, so here's the initial spectrum. Um, so this is the direct interaction approximation. Um, so here we have the, um, the DNS. And the dotted line here is a regularised form of the direct interaction approximation. So regularisation is just a simple procedure to approximate these higher order vertex terms. So all we do is we, we choose to localise um, or zero the interaction coefficients, k, p, q, if p is less than k on alpha 1 or q is less than k on alpha 1 uh, in these interaction coefficients for the, the two time uh, cumulant uh, terms right, and response functions. So this is just empirically imposing this uh, localization of interaction uh, across, you know, wave numbers. So what we found was that that there was uh, almost a universal choice of this parameter, and it didn't matter whether we were doing the inhomogeneous problem or the homogeneous problem, or in fact, you know, the, the strength of the topography. So it, it turns out to be, a, you know, a pretty efficient approach. Um, well, maybe it's a pragmatic approach to deal with this difficult problem of, of what to do with, with vertex renormalization. So as I said, regularization ensures that the transfers between the large to small scales proceed by a cascade that's local in wave number. And it also localizes the eddy mean field and eddy topographic interact transfers. So um, one of the experiments was here. Here we have, an, uh, again, this is um, a comparison to ensemble average direct numerical simulation, so we, a couple of thousand realizations, starting from an initial state uh, where we specified a single realization of a random topography with the following functional form. And we start with a mean field uh, of the following form. So the mean field's dominating the large scales, uh, and this is the initial transient spectrum. And so here we've, we've, we've evolved this thing out for, for quite a time. So the, the initial um, transient kinetic energy spectrum has come up. It's sucked energy out of the large scales. And you can see there's a very good uh, correspondence between the DNS uh, and, and this uh, two-point closure. So if you look at the skewness, though, and these jumps, are these restarts, in the, skew, in the skewness, we're, we're actually underrepresenting the skewness 
but the point here is that small scale large amplitude topography is actually acting to localize um, transfers. Okay. But if we go to a spectrum that's more like the atmospheric state, where you know the small the small scale uh, mean field um, is 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 actually uh, orders of magnitude weaker than the small scale transient field and then we evolve this thing forward, what you find is we have a dramatic underestimation not only in the transients, but also in the eddy mean field, eddy, you know, the contributions from eddy mean field, eddy topographic transfers. And so we have this uh, huge underestimation of the skewness. And so when we apply this empirical vertex renormalization, we can actually correct for that. Um, and we get a, we get a, a, a very good agreement um, be, is at, at, at all scales. And you know, it, to some extent, you, you have to do a, a lot of um, realizations of DNS to, to resolve some of these, these small-scale features. So it's kind of a curious thing because the um, the, the, the the DIA, you know, the, the physical argument is that you know it's this um, spurious uh, that the very the large-scale eddies are interacting directly with the small-scale eddies and destroying them. Um, but none of that applies for these uh, eddy mean field, eddy topographic interaction terms. And so just sort of in a, in a simple diagrammatic way, we can show that um, it's, it's almost a topological uh, result of having, again, uh, uh, that the, the terms involving the mean field to topography essentially form a propagator, and you have these uh, single loop expressions for, for the inhomogeneous terms. So to, to Markovianize this system, um, we applied um, the... Uh, the Bowman et al. ansatz for the FDT, and, and this big white gap here is that uh, when you, you, you apply this and rewrite the equation for the single time um, diagonal cumulant, um, you can derive uh, unique uh, triad interaction terms for, for all of these um, terms that involve um, mean fields and, and you know, the inhomogeneous terms. And so rather than do that, I'll just write this in, in the simplified form here. And so, so we have a, a new equation for the, the single time uh, diagonal cumulant. And we have to re replace um, the, the, the response function by this Markovianized variant, OK? And so Bowman suggested that this is a, a natural consequence of supposing that self-energies are Markovian, but you know, it does seem to be something stronger. Um, so rather than... And, Rather than you know showing you many pages of mathematics to, to derive the um, these unique triad interaction uh, times, um, a simple way to do this in, and to do it numerically is to is to do essentially what you would do with going from the DIA to the SCFT or the LET. So we're going to replace um, the the QDIA response function with this Markovianized variant, the two time cumulant by the FDT, right? Um, and then that, that will all flow through um, and, and um, we get a, a Markovianized variant. But I, I will, will say one thing. So, in, in, so this is really rewriting the mean field equations. So if we rewrite the mean field equations, again using this FDT uh, ansatz of, of Bowman, uh, they have these two terms that pop out. And in fact, there's another one. And from here, you can see that you're going to get unique triad uh, relaxation times. So um, the QDIA itself is actually realizable. It, it has a, a, an underlying uh, or generalized Longevon equation. It has an exact stochastic model representation, um, which, which takes this form. Uh, and I'll just jump to, to, to some results. So here we, we, we have a, an initial topography. We have a top topography, which is a conical mountain centered at, at, at um, 30 north. Um, it's 250. Uh, 2,500 metres in height. We start with an initial um, spectrum that's that's where the where the you know vorticity is is anti-correlated with this structure, so a sort of a, a canonical equilibrium type initial state, uh, and then and then we start start the thing off. So we have um, a 7.5 metre a second uh, east, eastward large scale flow, and so it impinges on this conical mountain. And after about 10 days, we spin up these stationary Rossby waves. And so the correlation between the QDIA and 18, 1800 realizations of DNS is, is very high. Um, and to look at the kinetic energy spectra, so this is our initial um, um, mean field. 
This is our initial transient field, and so we're, we're sucking energy out of the transient field and generating this, this large-scale stationary Rosby wave at this mode here. Um, and so, so there's, there's a very close agreement there. So if we look at the, the Markovianized QDIA, and so here, I point out, so in the QDIA here, this is a full 10-day simulation. We ha haven't used the restart procedure. We've, we've contained you know, all of the information in the time history integrals. Uh, and the, 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 the Markovianized QDIA, again, and so, so they're, they're both largely indistinguishable. And so we look at the kinetic energy spectrum, there's good agreement. There's some slight agreement, you know, where the transients are resonant with this Rosby wave. But if we look at the, the palynstrophy, um, then you can actually see that, you know, it, it, there, there's very accurate agreement. So, so these are our initial results. Um, at fairly large scales, but if we compare them to some earlier work on um, looking at comparisons of the DIA, um, renormalized Markovian closure, and the self-consistent field theory at, at even at, at for three waves and, and for similar low resolution uh, studies, you know, th these are these are pretty pretty reasonable results. Um, so I think rather than Oh, so rather than go on and talk about subgrid terms, um, I think I might just end that there. Yeah. Thank you very much. No questions?